again, he's, he's a superior chemist. And I think to look at these ancient stories from the perspective of chemistry, again, it's, it's much more ingenuous to the science and the knowledge and the understanding of these ancient people. And the reason that we get the stories of magic is because it wasn't written by the chemists, it wasn't written by Moses or the Pharaoh, it was the spectators that saw this yeah. stuff and saw the transformations and they had no explanation for it. They didn't understand it was a chemical reaction and that these people were doing science when they thought it was just you know, literally snakes engulfing each other. So I always, I always loved looking at that story from that perspective. And again, pop the videos in here because that... that Hello, this is Alan from SJD, and I'd like to thank Jeffrey Drum for returning. Uh, you will find the links to um, in the description box to his YouTube, Instagram, and his website. And again, just to thank Jeff for coming back for a second uh, appearance. More to come, of course. Uh, in the first video, we had a brief introduction to a very quick glimpse of his hypothesis, talking about the purpose of not just the single pyramid, but the, but the pyramids themselves sort of form part of a complex, uh, which would uh, be very important to the economy and industry of this ancient civilization. Egypt was a vast country uh, extending over a thousand kilometers of the Nile River. The Nile Delta itself is one of the most fertile places on earth. It was a huge country. It had a very sophisticated bureaucracy. And uh, I think that's um, very interested in Jeff's ideas in regards to this because it's not asking again to take a great leap. It's we're, we're, we're talking basic, some very simple chemistry, not too different from the basic industrial chemistry that still underlies our civilization now. And these are not even modern developments. They really go back centuries and centuries. The exact date could be argued over, but the fact that they are ancient is not really disputed. Um, so we saw a sneak peek of the Red Pyramid, which only forms one part of this larger complex. And uh, again, thanks for Jeff for coming back. Well, again, we'll be showing more. But again, at this point, I'd uh, like to introduce uh, Jeffrey Drum. And, uh, and I think maybe the first topic would be to just respond to maybe some of the uh, early comments and, and your reception. Um, in regards to the first video, but uh, over to you, Jeff, and uh, hello from Australia, and how's it doing in the USA? Good morning, Alan, and uh, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to do this again. I thoroughly enjoyed making our last presentation and video, and one of the reasons I wanted to do this one was just as a follow-up to some of the, the feedback and the comments, I really, really enjoyed it. <laughs> uh, so this is the first time that I've put this material out there in a very public format. Of course, I've been promoting it on you know, social media and Instagram and Facebook, and I've had some family and friends buy the book, but those are all people that I know directly. And this is the first time that I can really reach out to a much wider audience. And whether the feedback was positive or negative, I absolutely love it. And it is the, the most amazing feeling to just feel that interaction with people who have seen the material and are um, impacted by it. It just, it's a really, really cool feeling. And I appreciate you doing this because it gives me a platform to kind of talk about this. I know that we've developed a pretty close friendship and relationship over the past couple of years. And it's, it's really cool to have somebody to talk about this with. So again, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, we'll kind of run through the same presentation that we showed before and just give a little bit of additional detail and yeah. response to some of the comments, because I really do appreciate that. Your ideas help me develop more ideas, and I'm also yeah. very curious to learn you know, how people are, are receiving this information, and if you have questions, please feel free to let me know. I'm more than happy to address them as best I can. Um, so I've been researching the pyramids of Egypt for probably 10 years. And the year prior to my trip to Egypt, 
I was really <coughs> focusing on some of the alternative theories of the Great Pyramid. So at that point, I was already well acquainted with the structures, with their internal configurations, and again, some of the alternative theories. And that's, that's why I went to Egypt, was to investigate that. But again, when we hit the ground, you very quickly realize that those theories aren't necessarily compatible with what you're seeing in person. So again, I've been looking into this for a long time, and I'm, I'm happy to address any questions. I'm not, you know, the expert on Egypt, but I feel like I've just been very, very lucky to stumble across a series of coincidences that cannot be ignored. And at some point, you know, when you have a number of correspondences and coincidences that continue to happen, it, it ceases to be co coincidence and it's more evidence that you're on the right track. So like you mentioned, um, you know, my social media, the book is available for digital download at thelandofchem.com, and you can follow me on Instagram at thelandofchem. I was actually talking with a friend who works for a lithography company, and we're going to be having hardback, beautiful versions of the book printed very, very soon. So that's, that's an exciting new step for me, and I'll be letting everybody know when they can get hard copies of the book. So um, again, I appreciate it. Sure. Well, uh, if you could tell us, uh, uh, now we'll be talking about a, maybe a little bit of a dry sense, but the, the, the book itself is not written as a highly technical document. You, as you mentioned in the first part, it's written as a novella. So really you're reading, although it's written as a story, there is a hard message behind it. But uh, the story itself... Uh, if you could tell us a little bit, to, but we, we really begin, there's two main characters who are far away travellers to Egypt, and uh, maybe you could just introduce, just as the book goes, so the way that the story unfolds, maybe if you could uh, just lay that out for us. Absolutely. So my original intention with this material was to write a research paper, you know, a scholastic style uh, thesis that contained all of these theories prevent, presented in a really scientific presentation. But, you know, I reached out to you and I showed you my full presentation and it took us about four hours to go through. And I remember that night like it was yesterday. And your enthusiasm and encouragement after that first presentation is really what inspired me to continue working on this because I knew that you were well acquainted with these structures you knew and were very familiar with the components and again, some of the alternative theories. And again, the fact that you were interested and encouraged by this, it, it really, it, it inspired me to keep on, keep on working. So I took this information to my father, who is a retired uh, US Army Colonel. And you know, he's, he's a bit of a hard ass. And I was, I was showing him this presentation just to see what he thought. And, you know, I pretty much anticipated at the end of the meeting, he was going to be like, man, you're, you're crazy as hell. <laughs> and, but after I showed him the material, he thought it was pretty compelling and it seemed like a valid theory and pretty legitimate. And he suggested that I write a fictional story. Um, I do not have a PhD in chemical engineering. I did consult with a PhD in chemical engineering in the writing process. And really, Ed helped me just to make sure that all of my technical details were accurate. I yeah. already understood the chemistry. I already understood the applications of the chemistry within the structures. And I just showed him the presentation and bounced some ideas off of him to make sure that my explanations were technically sound. So anyway, I showed, showed the presentation to my dad. He was like, you should write a, a fictional story. And that really resonated with me. So there is a great quote by Rudyard Kipling that says something along the lines of, if history were told in the form of stories, then it would never be forgotten. Yes. And I felt like that was a much more genuine way for me to present this material was to tell the story because to me, these structures are absolutely beautiful and they're so compelling. And the narrative format really fit better for me um, 
it also allowed me to tell the story of my experience traveling to Egypt. And it helped me to build a structure within the narrative to be able to present each one of these structures individually. So the story is of a young man's initiation into an ancient society that was responsible for the construction and operations of the pyramids. And the protagonist's name is Aquari, and he travels to Egypt from Ireland with his teacher, mentor, friend, and brother, Brother Julius, who is a senior member of the Order of Chem, which is the name of this yep. fictional ancient society. And Aquari is traveling to Egypt to receive the degrees of the Egyptian pyramids. He has been through his apprenticeship with the fraternity. He has been initiated into the science of chemistry. And now he's traveling to Egypt to learn the secrets of the Egyptian pyramids. And through each one of the degrees, he learns the operation of each individual structure. So the first degree is the step pyramid. The second degree is the red pyramid. The third degree is the bent pyramid. And then they travel to Giza to receive the final degrees of the Egyptian pyramids covering the Great Pyramid and the Middle Pyramid. Yep. And at the end of the book, Aquari becomes a master of the degrees of the Egyptian pyramids and returns to Ireland intent to rediscover the lost purpose of the passage chamber mounds of Ireland, like New Grange, Carrowkeel, Noth, um, Low Crew, all of those structures had a very similar function. They actually yes. had the same function, all producing the same thing. Um, but I do give an explanation for those at the end of the book as well. So again, the narrative style, just it, it allowed me to tell the story in a way that made sense to me. And I think it was a better representation of, again, the integrity of the structures. Again, I'm not qualified to write a research paper. Um, yeah. So. Well, like I've, my whole channel sort of started with this concept of geometry and weights and measures. That's sort of really always been my interest. And that you mentioned uh, the chamber passages, for instance, in, uh, in you know, Britain and Ireland. And I, always found, I found that interesting because they tend to have the same numbers and proportions actually built into them as what you find at the pyramid. So that's right. sort of one thing that interests me. Again, I'm not um, you know, super duper when it comes to chemistry myself. I haven't visited Egypt, so I can't really, you know, I have to rely you know, on, uh, this is your show basically really, but uh, I, it's just curious to me that there are so many whether it's from the uh, Indus Valley all the way across to ancient Ireland, that there are the same, uh, we're going to mention the step pyramid wall, for instance, the walls of the step pyramid are 33 feet high, which right. seems to be just like a common measure, you know, uh, just all across the, you know, the ancient world, whatever unit of measurement they were using, they seem to always come back to the same unit of measurement uh, or you know, series of numbers, but uh, even the, Alignments of those shafts also tend to be, you know, solstice or equinoctial marked markers as well, which is of I think of interest uh, to yes. just in series of connections between these supposedly unconnected places. Absolutely, and I think I've mentioned this to you before that you know we very much are in the same stream of consciousness. Um, we've just been fishing on different sides of the river. You know, you look at the external geometry, the architecture, the sacred numbers and proportions that are built into these structures, which at the end of the day, these structures were designed to teach people. You know, they, they certainly had a function, but the knowledge that was embodied within them could be interpreted and it could be extracted by measurement and study. So again, these are they're libraries of ancient knowledge. They are encyclopedias of the vast accumulation of knowledge of this ancient civilization. And the exterior is one component, the interior components are another thing, their operation is a third thing. So there's, again, as with any great esoteric mystery, there are always multiple layers of interpretation and significance. Yeah. 
And as you start to look at one of the layers, you peel that back and another layer becomes apparent. So again, there's, there's many different ways to look at these structures and evaluate their significance. I just happen to look at the inside of them and the functional aspects of it. But again, there, there's many more layers of significance and again, the measurements apply across the board to all of these ancient structures. So there's certainly similarities there, which you've gone into great, great depth on all of the measurements in sacred geometry. So again, we've always been very much on the same page in terms of, again, just looking at different aspects of the same structures. If I could just jump in there briefly. So just to give a rundown of what, what I actually didn't begin with an interest in ancient history. I actually began with an interest in, uh, let's say, uh, from the Renaissance basically onwards and, and how great cathedrals, but major public buildings in capital cities, Canberra, Washington, Brasilia, Astana, London, Paris, uh, all, this is not even controversial, like there's famous architects, um, I.M. Pei or Norman Foster would be one of them. There is m mainstream articles about the fact that they put mathematical meaning into their into their architecture of a golden ratio and these type it's not common right. knowledge but it's it's not at all controversial knowledge it's just and uh then myself i actually well where did this originate and the further i went back in time i just kept going back and was where it was uh medieval period the romans the greeks and eventually back to babylonians and the egyptians that this stream of knowledge and i believe it's what like, has to do with the quadrivium where it's not one thing it's multiple layers of um you know of knowledge let's call it and i think the quadrivium uh, astronomy music geometry and arithmetic and these are applicable to all because even even the quadrivium one thing that unites them all is basically weights and measures that there is like a common language between you know one of the defining things of a civilization is that it has a common set of weights and measures and uh this would also apply to chemistry in, in your particular sense as well. And so the quadrivium in itself is the four main you know, geometry, arithmetic, music and astronomy. But it was a way of, uh, I didn't go into study, like I, I know nothing about music. But by studying the geometry, the astronomy, the maths, I've actually initiated myself into music theory, especially Pythagorean music theory. And I think that, that this right. is the beauty of this system is like, even if you don't like a particular subject, you'll find yourself becoming educated in it just by the fact that you follow your favourite one. And so it's, you know, unlike today's modern system is, well, I like music, but I don't like maths. So you don't pay right. attention in maths as you do in music. But what happens in the older, the quadrivium, the, the seven liberal arts is, well, okay, you don't like music, no worries, study music, but by accident, you're going to become educated in maths and astronomy and geometry just right. by... You know, it, it, even if you try to resist it, you can't help it because that's part of the system. It's like a, yeah, I think the modern education system has a lot to explain for. Um, Absolutely. Not and too I, good yet. I think that's one of the beauties of the ancient system of knowledge is all of these disciplines are not mutually exclusive. You know, they all apply directly to each other. And by learning about one of them, it's, it's intrinsically connected to the next thing that you're studying. So again, I think that's one of the deficiencies of the modern system of, of teaching is that, you know, children are not taught that these sciences and disciplines are interconnected and it loses the magic and the beauty of what all of this is, which is interpretation of the natural world and the nature of the universe, which is so much more significant than just, oh, we can do these math calculations and then we go to the next classroom and then we learn about music. Well, you know, music is math. Music is geometry, math is geometry. Um, so they're, they're all interconnected. Um, well, now it reminds me of a, one of the first things I always do when I research anything is I, I just go into Google Images and I type in that subject and memes. So what are the memes on this particular right, subject? Right. And now it might be one that I saw. I uh, was that famous one of Fry from Fu Futurama. And the yeah. meme was, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm studying organic chemistry or uh, how to draw hexagons class, but the hexagon, the seed of life, but also in chemical um, notation, it's, it's triangle squares, hexagons and pentagons is, you've pretty much covered the bases there. 
right. uh, in, in terms of chemical structures as well. So it's you know very simple geometry, whether it's musical scales, math scales, but also chemistry is a, a direct connection to that. Absolutely, and even in uh, astronomy, I forget the cycle of time with which this is calculated, but the transit of Venus, you know, over 20,000 or 60,000 years or however long it is, it creates this beautiful, it's almost like a flower of life, sacred geometry, hexagonal pattern. And it's, it's again, it's, it's an indication of the, the design of the great architect of the universe, if you want to say it that, it that way. It's all, it's all very mathematical and very intentional. Um, so before well, we one do thing our off track, track, go ahead, go ahead. Well, one thing that, like, I'm, <laughs> I'm not, you know, I, I am a spiritual person, but I'm not in, into spirituality, let's say. Right. So I always, I'm, I tend to be rather dry and like, if I can't measure it, I don't want to know about it. But uh, right. by getting, I actually began as a skeptic and then I tried and I saw it and I said, okay, well, let's examine this. And I just, and it, well, as they say, I took the red pill and fell down a rabbit hole and it was just, oh yeah series of series after one and you know so even though like philosophically speaking i didn't i wasn't comfortable in the place i came to it was well these are the facts of of astronomy and of, and of time right and by studying just a few numbers like 108 and 27.3 i can tell you the r relationship of size between all the planets and the distances and, and how long their orbits are and i think at the very least if you take strip away everything else at the very bottom of this area is a a beautiful system of learning things in such a short time and, and just with a few key numbers or a, you know, a few key geometric drawings if you understand them on a couple of different levels as well sun earth moon music theory uh, mathematics music uh, I mentioned yeah music and geometry it, it just it's sort of all there and we spend you know in here in Australia we have six years of primary school and then six years of high school in a, in a couple of months, if you were to teach it more in the quadrivium style, I came out of high school, I had no idea how big the sun was in relation <laughs> right. to the earth. Right. And then with a few months of private study after I got interested in this, it's all, well, you know, not only can I tell you that, I, by the way, did you know this as well? And did you, you know, and it's, so yeah, at the very least, I think this is, this is a coherent system of um, uh, mimetics, uh, you know, as a neoplaton, you know, the, the study of memory and you know using those memory tricks to learn but i think right. that, you know whether it's just pure coincidence or whether it's design uh what we have actually have in nature is a series of just wonderful coincidences that well they actually correspond to chemistry as well and uh especially 27.3 but i could talk hours for that so I'll, I'll, I'll drop that subject and let you get yeah. back to it <laughs> So we'll, we'll probably get into all that in later videos. Um, but I, I've always said that geometry is the fingerprint of the creator and it's really stamped on everything in the, the physical universe. So let's, let's jump into it. Um, so today I just wanted to kind of address some of the, again, comments and feedback from the original video and we'll kind of dive into some different stuff. We, we chatted a bit before we started recording. And we have a couple of new things. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is the again the time frame for the book. And there was a comment in the the YouTube that you know the Sahara has never seen rainfall. And you know where did I come up with this time frame? Um, so I did not create this slide, right? And even the most preliminary of research, you will find this in well credited scientific data. These graphs were created using climatology data that had been collected in regard to the Sahara. And there was absolutely plentiful rainfall in the time period between 8500 BC and 5300 BC. There was climate change back then. Um, again, these red dots indicate where the populations would have accumulated during those time periods. And so again, prior to 8500 BC, everything was right around the Nile River and they had very, very limited developments because again, this was all a vast desert and there's not much you can do in the desert. However, yeah. when those, that rainfall began around 8500 BC, the Sahara was literally transformed. And again, just 
do a little research and you'll, you'll find this same data. This isn't something that I came up with. This is actual scientific um, and well-researched, well-publicized, definitely not fringe. So this is legitimate. And again, not something I came up with. So the Sahara was- I just, I just- from, Yeah, go ahead. I just dropped in that nab to player was uh, around about that time. And we see uh, uh, wall paintings of Uroks and people swimming and bathing. And it, it was quite right. a, um, I'm not an, uh, an expert on that particular time for it, but yeah, but the, there was a culture operating in the Sahara that was uh, swimming, moving large amounts of cattle. Nab to player would be like a famous aspect in regards to that. But uh, I, just as a declaration, I tend to go with the more conventional sort of timelines. But uh, even with them, around about uh, 2400 BC, there was a major climatic change as well in, in Egypt. And Correct. now I forget the, the pharaoh's name, but there's a famous uh, series of carvings on the um, causeway, which shows even that people from uh, the desert were coming into the Nile River. because, And they're, they're all shown... Uh, in, in very starved as well, but there has been. I'm gonna. I couldn't be too concise on it myself, but there has been a shift back and forth to some degree over time. I, I, I yeah, but and but again, that that cattle raising in the Uruk culture, and yep. I shouldn't call them but that, that culture that was operating in the Sahara and moving large herds of cattle it can Absolutely. be found in cave paint, uh, wall paintings. Some of the oldest uh, carvings as well is from that er um, era as well. And you, you bring up an essential point is the domestication of cattle and the expansion of farming during this time period. So you'll see that the population on this left slide, before 8500 BC, they're all around the Nile. And then as the desert began to transform into a more arable, lush environment, the population spread out they were farming this land, and it's during this time period that they start to see archaeological and historical records of the domestication of cattle in large quantities. And this is essential to the operation of the Steppe Pyramid, which we're going to get into that in the next video. And the following videos will cover each structure individually and go into much greater depth in terms of the operations and the chemistry. But Again, when you're, when you're building structures of this caliber, you need tons of farmland to be able to support the builders that were working on this project. It would have been a tremendous amount of people that would have been involved. Um, these were not slaves. They were master architects, master masons, masters of construction. Um, they were absolutely experts and professionals in the, the fields of interest. Um, so again, to say that these were built by slaves is an absolute travesty because these are masterpieces of every discipline that you could imagine from, from architecture and geometry to physics to chemistry. They're absolutely spectacular. So again, it's a, it's a big disservice to say that they were built by anything less than the most exceptional professionals that existed at the time. And one of the reasons that I use this time frame is because there was climate change that occurred around the creation of the dynastic Egyptian civilization. And I believe that is one of the reasons that the pyramids went out of operation. These structures were designed to utilize and harness water from the annual Nile River inundation. So when the flooding occurred, the water would be pumped basically or channeled into the pyramids and utilized within the structures, not only as a mechanism of their operation, but also as an initial reactant in the chemical reaction process. Um, so again, there was, there was multiple purposes for the water, but as the, desif desif the desification yeah, yeah, yeah. of the Nile, or the Nile River Delta and the, the Upper Sahara returned, the pyramids would have gone out of operation. You wouldn't have had the same amount of water. They wouldn't have functioned the way they had originally been intended. And there's also evidence that there's multiple catastrophes that kind of happened in this time frame, including earthquakes, massive flooding. So again, this is when they went out of operation 
And this is the beginning of the dynastic Egyptian civilization is around 3500 BC. If I just drop in, I'll, I'll try to remember to put the link in the description. There's a great channel, Dr. Raul McLaughlin, and his, his speciality is uh, Roman trade beyond the Roman borders. During, But uh, just the Nile Delta, which is just at the top of the screen, just where the river splits up, uh, that was such a rich and fertile area during Roman periods that actually fed about one quarter of the empire. They were able to export the grain uh, from there, while down on the uh, Red Sea coast, there was so much trade that the Romans were sailing directly to India. And there was so much trade going on that it works out that they, they could have paid for about uh, one quarter of their entire army would have been paid for just by the taxes collected through that part of the world. So the maps don't really show it, but like, Egypt is in a central, you know, it's like the Mediterranean on one side. Right. But it's only it's only a skip and a jump down to the Indian Ocean. And then, you know, you're into the current day Yemen, Saudi Arabia. And then you're a short sail away from the Indus Valley, which is another one of these ancient civilizations sort of known for its um, metallurgy, but it's, you know, trade uh, skills as well. So even during the Roman period, the wealth and the food that was coming out of Egypt was ab absolutely huge. It was a, a really, really rich country. And that's not including the, the earlier periods. That's, that's just during the Roman times. Right. So Egypt would have absolutely been an, an industrial and agricultural capital of the civilization. And it was, again, it was a worldwide civilization at that time. Everything was interconnected. They had extensive sea travel. What was being produced in Egypt would have been moved across the world and likewise it would have been bringing things from other cultures here. So it was absolutely kind of a crux of the civilization at that time. So one other thing that I forgot to mention during our initial conversation uh, was about the name of the book and the word Chem, K-H-E-M, the original name for the area that we now call Egypt. So we talked about that the traditional definition of the word Chem is derived from the alluvial soil around the Nile River, this dark, rich, fertile soil. But the one thing I forgot is, so the name alchemy means from the blackness. Alchemy is from the blackness. And that applies to the chemical extraction process of retrieving volatile salts from your original materials. So the first step in the alchemical process is calcification, where you burn down your raw materials. So essentially you're creating a blackness from your herbs or whatever you were using in the, the alchemical process. You burn them down and then use chemicals to extract the volatile salts. So alchemy from the blackness is literally referring to a process of chemical extraction from the blackness. And again, that's where we get our modern day word chemistry. Um, it all, so again, there's a technical definition that relates to the Nile, but a bit of a more esoteric definition that refers to that chemical extraction process from the blackness, which you create during the calcification process, the burning down of your raw materials. One of the things we were speaking about uh, just before we started recording, um, one of my favorite books, I think, like if you're interested in ancient history, this is just a must read. It's uh, De Architectura by Vitruvius, the 10 books of architecture by Vitruvius. And it goes through the philosophy of street plans, the philosophy of temple design, that famous image of uh, Da Vinci, the Vitruvian man, the guy with his hands outspread and his leg. That's based yeah. on. But uh, in Vitruvius, there's a section where he goes into the alchemy of the time. Um, and so the classical alchemical images, you have salt, sulfur, and mercury, which was the equivalent of an early version of the periodic table. So sulfur is something that burns, and once it's burned, it's gone. Salt is right. something which will not burn, and mercury is something that will burn, but you can recapture the vapor from there. So uh, in Vitruvius, he, he describes, you know, the, the rich people would have really fancy clothes with a gold thread, but the cloth would become worn out. And uh, the best way to, to get the gold back is basically to burn it, to turn it into ashes. 
and then to, just to mix it with mercury. And that forms an amalgam. Then you can, because uh, mercury has a lower boiling point, you just Correct. boil off the mercury and you're left with pure gold. Yes. Uh, that's something you will bring up for, but yeah, the um, salt, sulfur, and mercury. I'll try to put some images, you know, in there as well. But these are actually, again, very simple, ancient processes. You know, as long as people have been working with gold and had cinnabar, uh, uh, we, we touched on this in our discussions earlier, but the connection between mercury and pyramids in South America and China is a pretty interesting one as well because it's so important to the uh, metallurgy. It's, you know, mercury is just you know, the prima materia. It's the number one tool when it comes to working with metals. Right. And you'll, you'll see that same connection throughout these ancient civilizations is the importance of the minerals that they were working with. Again, yep. cinnabar was a very prevalent mineral um, that was ubiquitously used in ancient civilization. The same thing with ochre. And there was a recent kind of discovery that came out of a 12,000 year old ochre mine discovered in Mexico. And, okay, so the dyes and pigments that can be created using those minerals is the conventional explanation for that. But if you look at the chemistry, Again, cinnabar contains mercury, and ochre is made of iron oxide. So there would have been chemical applications that could have utilized these minerals to transform them and extract the components that were essential in, in later chemical processes. So I just wanted to, to chat a little bit about this receptacle here at the pyramids of Abu Sir. And we were talking a bit before this video that these conduits that run from the pyramids to wherever they might go, um, they're very prevalent in Egypt. Even at the Giza Plateau, there is a thick layer of black basalt, you could call it flooring. And it's the same here, yeah. the, the Temple of Abu Sir. And at Giza, there are these carved conduits that run underneath that black basalt floor layer and they run all over the plateau i mean they are you can see the exposed areas where that that black basalt flooring has been removed and these little conduits are running all over the place just interconnected across the, the plateau i don't know the specific function for those conduits at the giza plateau but again it's not compatible with the traditional explanation for these structures okay so if they were burial tombs why is there this interconnected network of conduits running throughout the structures you wouldn't need that if you're just putting a dead guy in there and again in egypt the burials were done in the valley of the kings and the burial chambers in the valley of kings are very much what you expect for a burial chamber it's a simple underground chamber that is well hidden um, you know, again, they had to dig and excavate into these things to be able to find the entrances. And you're not going to construct an above ground monument that could be easily accessed or easily broken into if that was actually the burial place for your most important pharaoh. You're going you're gonna to put it somewhere where it's well hidden and well protected. So again, the Valley of the Kings, that's where they find all the bodies. No bodies have ever been found in a pyramid. And that's not what they were used for. Well, uh, so amongst the comments we had from the first video, I think there were a series, like uh, basically three main points that were, were, were raised, and that would be the staining in the Red Pyramid uh, in regards right. to what was the cause of that. Fire was one suggested uh, um, before we go into that, but uh, the, um, sec well, one of you comment threads there was an interesting one the picture you just showed with that conduit uh well now i, I would just it would be an interesting question i can't answer the question personally but uh as we mentioned in the first part putrefaction or fermentation is one of the basic our chemical processes and wine making and beer making was of course very important in that time absolutely why, why would you you know like uh, could the pyramid of was it a wine or a bee making facility? I, I personally would find that a bit of a stretch, but 
uh, that these conduits coming out, that would suggest that there was access into these places after the, you know, the, the, the king had been buried in there, so to speak. Um, but which goes against that normal explanation. I think it's interesting, like Herodotus and these early uh, Greek and Roman writers, when they go to the Great Pyramid, they describe the door being open and that you could enter and they give a very accurate description of the interior. So it wasn't, you know, like they seemed to have known what was in there. And if, yeah, so if you could address that, um, that conduit that we saw and the possibility of fermentation or winemaking and beer making possibly. Absolutely. So the science of fermentation is chemistry. And in terms of the function of some of these smaller structures, I can't really say for sure because there are no diagrams of the internal components. There is no access to the inside of these structures. I have no idea what the insides actually look like. Some of them there are, but these ones in particular, um, there's no way for me to study or examine the interior components. So it's hard to say what was actually being produced. Um, one of the comments mentioned vinegar, you know, if vinegar I could just is acetic acid. In a moment. Um, if I'm going to step in a moment, the, like this pyramid we see on the left-hand side, I yeah. believe it could be the pyramid of Sahure, and the mortuary temple there had what they describe as the world's oldest plumbing. Um, so it was over 180 meters of copper tubing, and what's this, this described as drainage from the mortuary temple in there as well. That's something I, I just dropped in the last video. Right. But um, while we're here in Abu Sir, as well, it was something we mentioned. You know, earlier discussions and um, so and off chan the channels halfway between basically Saqqara and the Giza pyramid. So this is a possibility of of that. Sorry, yeah. no, no, absolutely. I mean, you're you're 100 right. So all of the indications at these sites point to functionality. The design of the interior components of these structures all indicate a function and again to say that they're just used as burial chambers it doesn't account for any of the other uh, components that are actually still existing and you can still look at them so okay the commentary in regard to the red pyramid uh, the first one and the most prevalent i guess would be the explanation of the bats causing the smell in the chamber and I'm certainly not saying that there were never bats in this structure. Again, in the bent pyramid, there still are today. And if you look at, you know, the Acida Project website, they have really, really great pictures of all of these structures. And there's definitely a bunch of bats in there, but there's, there's none in the red pyramid today. And so the smell inside this structure is of intense, pure chemical ammonia. And if this was an organic based smell, it wouldn't smell like pure chemical ammonia. It would smell like guano or it would smell like urine. There was also, you know, again, when we went down into this thing, our guide was given us the conventional explanation, uh, you know, that the bats caused the staining and that possibly even the guards of the structure would go down into the pyramid and, and urinate inside the, the pyramid when they had to use the bathroom. Well, if you have to take a piss, you're not going to crawl down into this shaft where it takes probably five or 10 minutes to get down into the inside of this thing. We can very easily just pee off the outside of it, which I'm certain is what they do. Um, Cause again, you're in the middle of nowhere and in the vast desert when you go out to see these structures, so again, I, I wasn't, and, and you could see here, the staining on the walls of the chamber, and I have some videos, and I think Acida Project website has them. It's very linear. There are linear patterns of the drip staining that start on the side of the chamber walls. And another comment was about that the, the staining in the upper portion of the chamber was caused by smoke from campfires. So there's a, there's a big, big problem with that. So first of all, this is not soot or carbon accumulation that is on the surface of the stone. 
this is staining that has literally penetrated the stone. And if it was soot accumulation, it would cover all of the tiers in the vault. Um, it would be all over e everywhere. And you can see that at the bottom of each tier is clean. You know, there's, there's no soot accumulation there. And another big problem with that is if you're burning fires inside this structure, there is absolutely no airflow. And very quickly, you're going to run into a significant problem with carbon monoxide. You know, if this was, you know, a bunch of people burning fires inside this thing and smoke accumulating in the top of the chamber, that's going to be a pretty bad situation. You don't want to be inside this thing when that's happening. So that's, that is not the reason for the staining. Again, there's, there's no soot, there's no carbon accumulation. It is a chemical staining that is seeped into the stone that is creating this. Um, and again, anybody who walks inside this structure and is given the explanation of the bats or the urine, when you're looking around at the, the chamber walls, it is absolutely not compatible. Um, again, you can see this little hole here, you know, in the bottom right corner. And there is a staining pattern that actually moves up the wall. And even here, coming from the, the connecting shaft that connects the first and second chamber, you can see the pattern of staining. If you look at this crack and kind of follow that crack, the staining moves from the shaft up into the upper portion of the chamber. You can see here on the left side of this wall that there's not much staining there. But on the right yeah. side of the wall, there is significant staining. So again, the staining within this structure indicates the flow dynamics that created the, the chemical reactions. And we'll, we'll get into that in much further detail in, in a further video. Uh, but I just wanted to address those, those two comments. Again, absolutely, the bats are the conventional explanation for the smell. I didn't see any bats in there. The, as far as I know, there's been other, other tourists have gone in here. And I'm not saying there never have been, but the pattern of the staining and the intense pure chemical smell of ammonia is not indicative of an organic accumulation of guano or bat urine because you would have you'd have other smells that um would indicate that it came from an animal yeah i just like to say as well that uh if you ever find yourself in a in a cave system or even a man-made tunnel system whatever you do do not light a fire because this will cause suffocation it will be you know if there's not a good ventilation correct um <laughs> i've seen it happen in caves but even tragically um they, they snuck underneath a bridge where you have that hollow part underneath a bridge and some young people uh, lit a fire in there, not good ventilation, and they found themselves dead very soon. So it's... Um, Correct. Again, yeah, in a tight space, uh, you've got poor ventilation, lighting it, no matter how cold it is, do not light a fire. You're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble very quickly. Right. So that was my... Again, when you're crawling down the shaft to get in this structure... As soon as you get in that first chamber, I had an overwhelming feeling that people were not meant to be inside these structures. And you get a very compelling sense that there was an industrial purpose for these things. And the fact that you're standing inside this, every indication is that people were not meant to go inside these things. They were, they yeah. were meant for, um, again, I'm not saying that by the time the dynastic Egyptians came around, they could have utilized these structures for different purposes. Again, initiation into sacred, sacred mysteries. The knowledge of what these structures were used for, I believe was absolutely still intact because the dynastic Egyptians were, were using chemistry, but it was just on a much smaller scale because again, the structures had gone out of operation due to catastrophe. They were no longer functional. And again, by that point, the dynastic Egyptians had moved on to the civilization that we currently know and understand of Egypt. So again, I just wanted to address those, that, that commentary in regard to the Red Pyramid. Um, in this picture particularly, this one here on the right, this old photo. So this is in the first chamber. And again, you can yep. see that staining pattern that moves from the top of the chamber 
and starts to flow down in through the connecting shaft into the second chamber. And this is incredibly evident when you're inside it. I mean, you can see it and, and picture it moving through the structure, which again came, kind of gave me um, a bit of a way to start looking into how these structures operated. Because again, there was a flow, flow system that moved from one chamber into the second chamber and from the second chamber into the third chamber. So as we're jumping here to the al alchemical portion of the presentation, I wanted to mention a really cool story. And you and I were talking a bit about this, and if you could put the videos in here, it would be awesome. So there's a story in the Bible where Moses is called into the inner chambers of the Pharaoh, and they have a demonstration and a competition using magic. And they both come in with staffs and they lay their staffs on the floor and they do magic conjurations and all of a sudden they turn into snakes. So I have a bit of a different interpretation of that story. Aaron, cast down my staff before Pharaoh that he may see the power of God. Power of your god is a cheap magician's trick. Janus. And if you look at magic from the perspective of chemistry, again, to the uninitiated and somebody that did not understand the applications of the science, chemistry is absolutely magic. And you well, put in that- an after Clark quote. Um, any sufficiently advanced technology would appear as if magic. Absolutely. And I, I love that. And it even still applies today, you know, as we get more advanced. I remember the first time I saw a Blackberry when I was a kid, we went to my, my uncle's house and he pulls out the Blackberry and I had never seen anything like that. You know, it was this tiny device with internet and all, I was like, what is the internet? You know, it could have been a, yeah. a, a device used for teleportation for everything that I knew. Yeah. And I could barely comprehend what he was saying, looking at this thing. And now, you know, we carry these things around like it was nothing. But, I, you know, I really distinctly remember the first time I saw that. Yeah. And it could have been a magic device. You know, <laughs> I'm, admitting, I'm admitting my age here, but I remember just when a mobile phone was Star Trek technology. And this yeah. would never happen in our lifetimes. And yet here we are. The w libraries of a world are on our little box we carry in our pocket. And I'm a, I'm a bit of, a, you know, an antiquarian when it comes to technology. And even my brother and sister have these little, you know, the Apple watches where they can text, you know, they have their grocery person shopping for groceries and they're 
text that, you know, like it's Star Trek or, or Dick Tracy or something like that, where they have these little communication devices. It's crazy. Yeah. So anyway, um, so let's imagine that story of Moses and the Pharaoh dueling magic from the perspective of chemistry. So there's a great reaction where you can use sugar and sulfuric acid and you get the sugar into a container and you pour sulfuric acid on it and it very quickly creates this steaming snake of carbon and it's this big black steaming kind of snake like thing so let's yeah. imagine you know again to the to the spectators watching this thing the pharaoh pulls out a rod and it's this compressed white rod and yeah. the chemical perspective we know that it's sugar right so the pharaoh lays his sugar rod down on the floor and pours some sulfuric acid on it and all of a sudden it transforms into this big black steaming snake and all of the spectators are in horror and shock and ah you know <laughs> watching yeah, this yeah. thing transform on the floor and then walks in moses and he is the superior chemist and he's looking at this simple reaction of sulfuric acid and sugar he's kind of laughing to himself he's like oh that's that's child's play compared to what i'm about to do so he pulls out his staff and it's also a compressed white rod and to the spe spectators it looks exactly the same he lays it down on the floor and lights the tip on fire and all of a sudden there is the reaction of mercury thiosulfate and when you set mercury thiosulfate on fire it creates an absolutely spectacular reaction known as the pharaoh's serpent and even to me or anybody watching this in the modern day it is absolutely crazy to see this thing form and there's this blue fire that comes out of it and it almost looks like it appears out of the ether you know the way this yeah. materializes and imagine the shock and terror of the spectators that are watching this thing. And it just keeps growing and growing and it turns into this almost like octopus type thing with these multiple tentacles. And you've got the piddly little Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's black carbon snake laying on the ground and this other thing just yep. and, and And Moses is sitting there like, yeah, that's what's up, <laughs> you know? Um, Cause again, he's, he's a superior chemist and I think to look at these ancient stories from the perspective of chemistry, again, it's, it's much more ingenuous to the science and the knowledge and the understanding of these ancient people. And the reason that we get the stories of magic is because it wasn't written by the chemists, it wasn't written by Moses or the Pharaoh, it was the spectators that saw this yeah. stuff and saw the transformations and they had no explanation for it. They didn't understand it was a chemical reaction and that these people were doing science when they thought it was just, you know, literally snakes engulfing each other. So I always, I always love looking at that story from that perspective. And again, pop the videos in here because that, that reaction of the mercury thiosulfate yeah, is, is absolutely spectacular. And just imagine somebody watching that who didn't. We were kids. We were still allowed to have fireworks here in Australia, and one of the, you know, it come a little silver foil sachet it was just called snakes. Yeah. And we would light them on fire, and it would create the snake. But still, now um, people are in awe of fire. Like you put on a fireworks show, people come to watch. You know, and it's just really some basic reactions. If you add some copper, some right. um, uh, what's it? Uh, cobalt or uh, just add by these basic chemicals in there you get these colorful reactions and even in this time where it's like literally at your fingertips to know what's happening people are still amazed by the you know the the whiz and the bang and the colors of yeah of fireworks to this day and this is at a time when we should all know about it but go back you know when it was a little bit more mysterious and esoteric these kind of reactions would have been magical in the harry potter sense of the word where people literally thought that the magistar or the you know the magi was performing supernatural magic rather than something that could be replicated by the normal person correct correct um so let's let's keep on moving um i didn't have much i wanted to dive into in regard to there wasn't many questions about the alchemical drawings 
again, those were just things that kind of pointed me in the right direction. And they were just indications that what I was looking into might be valid and it was worth further investigation. And I, I love this comparison. Um, this is when I really got those kind of chill bumps type feeling when I, when I stumbled across the comparison between the modern apparatus used to produce ammonia and the components of the red pyramid. Um, there is such a similarity here. And again, the designer of this modern apparatus could have chosen any configuration he wanted. It didn't have to look like this. But again, I, I think it was intended kind of as an homage to the, to the place from whence it came. Um, I won't get into too much detail on that. As we'll come well, all the pyramids are the same um, in design, but each pyramid is very unique in its internal design. That's something that is very... Correct. Uh, yeah, cute, you know, so if it was just slight modifications, like, but this is one of the things that you, why your idea intrigues me is because they are so radically different, whether it's the Step Bent, uh, Red Pyramid, the Great Pyramid, or the Cafre or the Mancara Pyramid. Probably Cafre and Mancara are relatively similar, but of, of the six major, you know, the, the big pyramids that people are familiar with, they are very, very similar exterior. Uh, the, inter the way that they're built, very similar, but the internal designs are very radically different from one to the other, which is something that I can't resolve and I think maybe you, your um, hypothesis adds some interest to because it, I think, um, even the Great Pyramid design you've shown, it, there is a curious correlation between various um, uh, uh, um, industrial chemistry. and these, yes. So it's not just Red Pyramid, we've spoken this privately, but there is very curious connections between yeah, industrial chemistry and, and the design layout of the... I was going to say, don't don't spoil the secret yet. <laughs> okay, I'll wait. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to get you there. I'm trying to get yeah, you there. Yeah, I know, I know, I um, know. So from an engineering perspective, right, form implies function. And if you look at any modern day machine, there's a reason it's built why it is because it has a job to do. And it is the exact same with the pyramids of Egypt is there is a progression in the sophistication of the composition of these structures. You know, the step pyramid starts off as it's a very, very simple structure. It has one rectangular shaft as its main component. But as you move to the red pyramid, the architecture of the internal components is much more sophisticated. And the same when you get to the Bent Pyramid, and as you move up to the Great Pyramid, again, the evolution of the architecture is an indication of the progression of the chemistry. And as they experimented with these chemicals, they would have developed new reactions. And the new reactions would have been the impetus for the building of a new structure. Because as your chemistry evolves, you're gonna build structures that can produce these chemicals the same way we do today. When you have a discovering of something new, okay, well, let's build a machine that can create this on a large scale. So it's something that starts from a very small laboratory application where yeah. you're beginning to understand the science and the mechanisms of the production and the chemistry and then you extrapolate that knowledge and you engineer it into a structure to produce it on a larger scale. And the pyramids utilized very, very simple physics uh, in their operation. Again, these were, these were master architects. They were master engineers. They were masters of physics and chemistry. And they knew how to utilize nature to accomplish these feats where we today mostly harness electricity and heat to, to produce our reactions, but they did it in a much simpler way to achieve the same end result. So I'm very much looking forward to diving into this in further detail. Um, one of the things I wanted to say was just thank you to you, Alan, and to everyone that watched that first video. 
it's, it's unbelievably overwhelming to me to see that that video has reached a thousand views already. The fact that people are even just interested in this idea, it means the world to me. Um, this is something I've been working on for a very, very long time. And I put a lot of time into this, this theory and it's not just some crackpot, unscientific, you know, out of the blue idea. Um, Again, I, I worked with a PhD in chemical engineering who was a master's level professor. And he also has several patents, both US and international, for you know, chemical engineering designs that he's created. And I showed him the full presentation. We went through this material in detail and he scrutinized the hell out of me and basically treated me like I was a grad student you know, presenting a thesis to him. And he put me through the ringer in terms of having me explain the rationale behind my theories, going into very detailed explanation as to how each one of them operated, explaining each individual component, why I thought these components could produce the reactions that they were. And at the end of the day, he was very entertained and very enthusiastic about the ideas and told me it's the best theory that he's heard and that it is the most scientifically valid and well-researched because again, there's a lot of stuff out of there um, that just, it doesn't have any scientific backing. So. Well, that's something I'm eager and excited. So uh, the first one and this one, we've really just been introducing the ideas, but I think as it progresses, I'd, I'd like to get to a point, but I'm more familiar with it and to be able to ask you some more probing questions, but it's very exciting that you, know, that you have spoken to this, uh, fellow who's obviously much more educated than me in that particular topic and I think that's the the best thing you can do is look for you know if you find something you can follow the path and you'll find you know but if you're not stopping to say well what's you know if you're not looking for the little detail because one little detail along the way can be a you know a, a, a derail something as well so I'm excited right. to hear that you have spoken with we're there and that um, I can hopefully probe you in the future in regards to uh, well, the questions that I want to bring up eventually, because I'm still like, even though I was introduced early to this, I'm, I'm still learning as we go because I'm not um, up to date with your, your, your most recent uh, uh, sort of talking points in regards to this. So I'm very excited in the future to get into this. And that's why I'm excited about this idea because it is something that you can, literally test it's not something that relies on right. a, a leap of faith um and some unknown mysterious you know sort of phenomenon and not that those things don't exist i can't discount them but I, I i do like to if i can't sort of get my teeth into it i don't believe it's there you know what i mean it's it's right then you get into you get into a wishy-washy area where it's you know once you start adding one rubber band and you add another rubber band to it and before you know it, you've stretched it to, as we say, all buggery, you know, and right. um, not a good so, place to be. No. So generally speaking, um, criticism and critique shouldn't break you down. It should make you better. And Excellent. that Excellent. is, that is really what I was looking for when I brought this, research to you and I brought this research to my dad and I brought this research to Ed, um, the guy with the, the PhD is I wanted this to be good and I wanted it to be technically sound and I wanted somebody to kind of break my balls and put me through the ringer and really make sure that I thoroughly understood what I was talking about before I put this into writing. And again, it helped me make the theories better and one of the reasons that I'm th so enthusiastic about putting this out to the public is because I'm interested in hearing people's comments. Um, maybe you've thought about something that I haven't thought about or I haven't addressed. And it also gives us talking points for, for later videos because again, it's just such a cool feeling to, to see people's interactions and feedback. And uh, yeah. it's just a really cool experience. So I, I just want to say thank you to everyone out there for, for your interest in this material and for your support. Um, as the video was, um, what are you premiering on YouTube? You know, I was asleep, <laughs> uh, you know, my phone kept going off with some, some book sales notifications, which was, I was happy to lose sleep because of that. Um, <laughs> okay. if, if you're interested in reading the book, 
Um, again, I give a very thorough explanation for the function of the step pyramid, the red pyramid, the bent pyramid, the Giza pyramids, and structures in Ireland such as Newgrange. And the website is www.thelandofchem.com. You can follow me on Instagram, at thelandofchem. Um, I also have these awesome t-shirts, which I got a whole bunch of them just so I could wear them myself because I, I think it's so cool. So I have them in all sorts of different colors and uh, you know, I, I wear them to the gym and, and when I'm out and about so people can see it. But the links to the t-shirts are also on my website and I have a yep. Teespring store. It's like Teespring, the land of chem, search for it. And uh, guys, thank you so much, Alan. No problem. All those links <laughs> it was a blast. Again. Remember to pin them to the top of the comments as well. So yeah, you, you'll find all those links in the description yep. or, or in a pinned comment. Awesome. Well, Alan, man, thank you so much. Uh, you know, again, we, we probably jumped on today to make a 15 minute video. This is probably closer, closer to an hour now. Um, I'll be I, just, about I really appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, so just to give the viewers an idea of what's coming up, we'll, we'll probably do an, a bit of a podcast. Would you call it that? Um, where we're just going to be openly discussing some, some theories out there, maybe taking a look at some, some other people's research. And uh, again, just, I think it's better to look at the overall scope of what this ancient civilization was about. Um, focusing on one thing specifically, it's very narrow. And to be able to understand the bigger picture, you have to look at everything that was going on. And it's not just about the, the structures in Egypt. There's these ancient structures in Ireland and ancient structures in Mexico and ancient structures in Japan. And they're all over the world. And again, this, this was a global civilization at that time. So they, they were interconnected. Um, they were all sharing knowledge and information. And again, each one of these structures has a very specific purpose. I'm, I'm kind of holding back on some, some material. There's, there's lots of stuff to come. No problem, I mean. Well, I'm very eager to carry on with this and we'll, you know, I wanna, uh, yeah try and give you a bit of a, a, a bit of a prod and we'll, we'll get, you know, through those six steps and on, on to Ireland and, um, and later as well. But again, you know, I think it's such a, it's not just the actual idea itself, it's the implications that it can have for other features. I think, you know, I right. personally, I'd, I'd rather just have it, you know, straight out there, but I think, you know, cause we've had these discussions, we're sort of familiar with this ourselves uh, for the viewer, maybe might be better to you know to do a more you know stepped entry into there maybe some viewers who are familiar would be like come on come on but we yeah. are getting <laughs> on, i believe you know like um yeah we'll, we'll get there like with the last video i'll try and put in a few brief segments at the beginning so you get an overview so if you are a little bit eager to get in there you, you will get a a basic overview of, of today's discussion and if you're new to this, you know, probably would be best to go and follow some links as well. And um, because I think because we're sort of both been into this for a few years, you know, we, we've got a assumed knowledge between us two. But maybe for someone who's new to this, there are like there's a whole there's thousands of years of history, actually, especially in regards to chemistry that's, that's sitting there. And it, you don't really get a, a, a full appreciation uh, of where they were back then unless you sort of you know understand how we got to where we are now and that's a long interesting history in itself right so as with any initiation into great esoteric mysteries you don't get all the knowledge up front <laughs> you know it's a it's a step-by-step -step process where you are gradually brought into the fold and the secrets are unveiled and that is absolutely my intention with these videos. Obviously, we're, we're trying to wet your whistles a little bit. And yep. I, just, I just hope this is entertaining. It's a lot of fun to make these videos. Uh, I always have a blast talking with you, Alan. This is, it's awesome for me. And I just I really, really appreciate it. And just stay tuned. We, we've got a lot of stuff coming. And it, it will get more and more interesting as we get more into depth. Um, this is just kind of scratching the surface and giving you an idea of, where this came from, who I am, what the book is about, and then we'll, we'll dive into it later. Well, thanks again, Jeff, for uh, coming on. And for those who have found this interesting, yet more to come. And uh, signing off from 
Australia here and any uh, last words? Uh, I just want to say, as always, it is an honor and a pleasure to work with you, Alan. Um, I really, really appreciate your support. It means the world to me. And uh, again, everyone out there, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your interest. And uh, so cheers from uh, the United States. No worries, man. Have a good one and we'll catch up with you soon. Sounds good, Alan. Thank you.